Well, I too am honored to have an opportunity to speak to you today. Um, and I think certainly the notion that cancer uh, was a disease of the, is a disease of the genome has been around for a long time. In fact, it was first proposed by, oops, it was, you know what, I'm going to use a keyboard. It was first proposed by Theodore Bovary, who um, uh, was studying cells under the microscope uh, and with various stains that were available at that time uh, basically a century ago, and proposed that defects in chromosomes would lead to abnormal cell proliferation and that could underlie cancer. So this idea, uh, although we're, we're capitalizing on it now, this idea was proposed a century ago, but it got waylaid for good reason. Uh, and there were some competing theories out there, one of which was that cancer maybe really was caused by viruses and not by a, an abnormal genome or abnormal chromosomes. And in fact, you could argue that, uh, that Varmus and Bishop, uh, w when they sort of set out to study uh, why uh, Rouse sarcoma virus caused cancer, uh, we're expecting to understand what about the virus uh, caused cancer. So the, the observation that, uh, in fact, the cancer-causing agent, SARC, was actually present in the normal genome. It was a perturbed version of the normal genome, really gave new life to the idea that it's really about the genome having gone wrong in cells that cancer arose. And even uh, after that observation, th there, was a, there was a flurry of discoveries that really by the early 1980s gave us the basic language for thinking about somatic genomics alt alterations in cancer. And it was known by basically 1982 that there are three major categories of somatic alterations. Base mutations, this is codon 12 of RAS, shown here, probably the most mutated codon in all of cancer. There are chromosomal copy number alterations, either amplifications or copy gains that give you too much genetic material, uh, and, or deletions, copy losses that inappropriately take away material that would keep the brakes on cancer. So this is another important category. Uh, and there are well-known uh, oncogenes, uh, MYC and ERB2, for example, that are uh, amplified, and then, of course, tumor suppressors, RB, et cetera, uh, deleted. And then finally, there are translocations or DNA rearrangements, and uh, BCR able was the classic one, but now we recognize many of these. So the, the language, the genomic language, although we didn't use the term genomics at the time, for th speaking about cancer genetic alterations was all in place by uh, the early 80s. But it took uh, multiple sort of revolutions, both technological and experimental, to really give, uh, to breathe fire into the equations that, as it were, of really unlock how important genomic derangement and how extensive genomic derangement was in cancer. So what I'd like to do is give a couple of vignettes about uh, the insights that have come now from the, the human genome era and that uh, are continuing to accumulate in, uh, in the present day with the explosion of genome information. And I'd like to give uh, some examples of what we learned biologically and then I'll move to the implications for precision medicine, which you've already heard some introductions to. And, you know, this is, a, this is one of these areas, particularly in the uh, zero-sum game world that we now live in of research funding, where there has been an active conversation, some would even say an argument, about the relative benefits of large-scale, very expensive government-funded projects that arguably take, steer money away from traditional R01-funded research. And uh, I'm not going to sort of uh, try to argue uh, exclusively for one or the other, but I think certainly it's, it has been the case that these large-scale projects have taken us in directions that are crucially important for cancer biology and therapy that many of us were not thinking about at all before these projects started. So let me just give a few high-level examples. So one of, the, one of the early fundamental insights that came out of sequencing an entire exome in cancer was uh, emerged from a study led by the group at Johns Hopkins, uh, and actually this was a, a sequencing study of glioblastoma that was published around the same time as the TCGA study, and they sequenced a very small number of cancers, but completely, meaning all, all of the protein coding uh, gene exons at the time, which was a huge feat, and they discovered that there is a, a gene called isocitrate dehydrogenase that was mutated very commonly in, glio in glioblastoma, brain cancers. Now, isocitrate dehydrogenase 
is a member of the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle. So any of you guys who took college biochemistry, which I'm sure is a large fraction of the audience, would have had to memorize this and then take the test and forget six weeks later. Um, <laughs> and, you know, and it was a very forgettable enzyme, but lo and behold, it's mutated in a large fraction of brain cancers and uh, AML and at a lower uh, frequency in some other cancer. But what was even more remarkable was that the mutations, so initially one thought, okay, well maybe this is disrupting the production of alpha ketoglutarate, but it turns out the mutation was a, it was neomorphic. It gave a new function to this enzyme. So it caused alpha ketoglutarate to become a, what we call an oncometabolite, 2-hydroxyglutarate. And among the things that 2-hydroxyglutarate does is essentially interfere with a whole series of enzymes that are normally controlled by alpha ketoglutarate, for example, histone methyltransferases, the TET uh, enzymes, histone demethylases, agalin enzymes, which are involved in response of cell to hypoxia. So uh, this, this spectrum of alterations has an entire uh, series of effects, one of which is major dysregulation of DNA methylation in genomes. And it has given rise to an entire field. And in fact, there are now therapeutics being developed against mutated IDH1 and IDH2. So, this is a whole field that now exists, all traced to this one discovery from a bold project sequencing 11 or 12 or so glioblastomas, which was thought to be far too few to learn anything. It probably was, but uh, lo and behold, this popped out. Uh, and it has now forged a durable link between the notion of genomic alterations and deranged cancer metabolism. So the, the, the Warburg effect and, and, and the importance of cancer metabolism has really been galvanized in many ways by this discovery. Now, another fundamental insight has been really the, the genome telling us that we need to look beyond the genome. So that I guess I, I'm not, I don't know the art world very well, but I'm sure there's an impressionist analogy that I could use for that. But the, uh, what we can see here is a whole series of uh, enzymes, for example, that modify the histone tail and then uh, regulate chromatin compaction. This is the switch sniff complex. And what you can see is that these are now decorated with genes that are recurrently mutated across many, many cancers. So the derangement of chromatin and epigenetic modifiers and the extent to which this is relevant and selected for in cancers, many, many cancers now, is probably one of the most groundbreaking discoveries in aggregate of cancer genome sequencing. And now, what it also has done is, so this is a hugely important discovery in aggregate, set of discoveries, but it's also reminded us of how ignorant we are, because in most cases we don't know what the, what the chromatin targets are, or target genes that are dysregulated in concert by these, uh, by these various mechanisms, but clearly it's important and we have to get a handle on it. In some cases, uh, there are already therapeutics uh, that, are, that are being developed, and even in the clinic in some cases, to target some of these enzymes. A third enzyme, this, uh, a third insight, which really, I, I would say, took the field by a complete surprise, of, and this is only two years old or so, was the importance of mutations in mRNA splicing. So mRNA splicing, I mean, of course, we all know that it's important to regulate gene expression, post transcriptase et cetera, but I don't think anybody had realized uh, how important uh, somatic mutations in splicing would become, and in fact, in tumor in uh, malignancies like myelodysplasia and uh, and uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, and even in some solid tumors like lung cancer and breast cancer, several of these uh, splicing factors are mutated recurrently. And in fact, some of these mutations appear to be gain-of-function events. And it turns out that there's even a drug in that has been tested in clinical trials that is known to affect the spliceosome, the SF the SF3B complex. Uh, now, it was never, of course, deployed against patients who had splicing mutations in the tumors, but now, of course, the idea of targeting the splicing machinery has new life when, in fact, I would argue there was hardly any life for that at all before this set of discoveries. And then the final one I'll just uh, mention right now is that in squamous malignancy, so head and neck squamous carcinoma, lung squamous carcinoma, cervical squamous carcinoma, it turns out that there are a, a whole series of mutations, uh, often in 30 to 40 percent of cases you can argue that there's at least one of these, that disrupt squamous differentiation. So the concept of maturation arrest is actually a very old one in cancer. In fact, most of the translocations that were discovered in leukemia by karyotypic analysis affect uh, core binding factors or transcription factors that arrest the maturation of that particular hematopoietic lineage. But now, the idea of maturation arrest is gaining traction in the solid tumor arena, and the squamous malignancies are one area in large part because of cancer genome sequencing 
has really put this on the map in a way that I think was not appreciated before. So th these are four uh, cross-cutting categorical insights that have really awakened whole subsets of field of biomedical research. And now, I think you can argue, center uh, a lot of hypothesis-driven work that can be focused in these areas. Now, I'm going to mention what I think could be another important insight, and I'm just going to shamelessly point out that this is coming from our group and it's being published, I think, just today in Cell. But I want to describe uh, one more uh, uh, insight that we would not have known about had we not done whole, not even whole exome, but whole genome sequencing in a subset of cancer. So this is a figure from an, an older paper that we published uh, a couple years ago showing a, a complex rearrangement pattern uh, that we discovered in prostate cancer. I'm not going to walk you through, and you can already look at this and say, well, it's a pretty figure, but it's kind of complicated. And that's basically where we were. But there was actually a method to the complexity. And when we sort of stepped back and thought about what the rearrangements looked like and what they were telling us, it actually gave, uh, gave us a view into what could be a very important cellular process that, uh, that happens and then goes wrong in cancer. So let me walk you through what we think is happening and how we think it's happening. So uh, the, what we, we initially called them closed chains of rearrangements, and they're in a subset of prostate cancers that have recurrent rearrangements in the ETS transcription factor family. And so what we think is happening is that, so let me just back up and point out to you that transcription happens uh, in many cells. It appears to happen in a physically localized region of the nucleus. So they've been named transcriptional hubs. So this is a little bit different. Uh, I used to, when I was in college anyway, I, I learned about transcription as thinking about the DNA as a rod, and there were uh, cis-acting elements, and transcription factors would come sit down on that rod and sort of send transcription you know, to the right of the screen. But in fact, uh, obviously DNA is not a rod. It's uh, you know, floppy and exists as a fractal in the genome. And in fact, uh, different disparate regions of the genome can migrate to, to transcription hubs. And what we think happens uh, is that these, th these come from different chromosomes or different regions of a chromosome. And for some reason that we don't understand, errors happen. Breaks in the DNA happen, but they get erroneously repaired. So rather than being repaired back to their partners, they can sort of propagate themselves and be misrepaired. And if that happens, you get well, this is why we call it sort of closed chains, because you can see that they, they're, there's a series of breaks, but they kind of come back to the beginning. So A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to D, and D goes back to A. So it's a closed chain. Chain is not circular. It's sort of uh, a propagation event of errors that kind of comes back um, to where it started after those errors are made. So this is basically what we were seeing in some of the prostate cancers. Now, this is all well and good, it's all fascinating, and it sort of gave us uh, a perspective that, yes, transcription is dynamic, and this could be one, you know, transcriptional dysregulation could be one way that rearrangements form, but we hadn't realized how important this insight could be until one of the uh, MD-PhD students in the lab, Sylvan Baca, realized that the, these breaks uh, that were happening could be more complicated. So, what can happen, so what we initially had seen was that we had sort of said these, these are single, uh, these, these are clear breaks and there's no uh, deletion or only micro deletion and they, and they get repaired. But in fact, what often can happen is that there, the deletions can begin. So there can be deletion bridges that occur after the breaks happen. So when that happens, various regions of the DNA, so not only is there a, re a rejoining, but d these regions of the, uh, that are deleted are now gone, and so this, then the errors happen. And so now what you can do is say, we're not only going to look for change, but we're also going to look for DNA that's missing at the breakpoints. And this sort of, it's rather subtle and complicated, but this recognition that there can be deletion bridges and not just clean breaks and rejoining led us to, well, led, I, I can't take any credit for this, but Sylvan, uh, who turned out, although he didn't tell me this when he came to the lab, turned out as a genius, and he said, oh, this is just a graph theory problem. Uh, all we have to do is, you know, take the, uh, the breakpoints of the nodes and the chromosome, the deletion bridges are the edges, and we're just going to, you know, come up with a, 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 an algorithm that, that applies graph theory, finds these events, and actually tells us how often we see these chains. And, the bottom line, when he did this, and he applied this now, we had a much larger set of prostate cancer genomes thanks to uh, a center-initiated project funded by the NHGRI, so we had about 57 whole genomes by that time. And what he found is that these events are incredibly common. So 84% of primary prostate cancers have at least 
one chain. So we actually, uh, we decided by this time that we needed to give it a new name. We thought the Sanger Center can't have all the fun naming, uh, you know, chromo events. So we gave this a name, chromoplexy. And so you, now these are circus plots where the different color codes are different chains that you can detect in, uh, within a, a, an individual genome. So 84% of primary prostate cancers have at least one chain and two thirds have at least two chains. And so this, this is prevalent enough that you can imagine that maybe the ones that don't have one are simply because we didn't sequence deeply enough. Of course, you know, there's a lot of stromal admixture. So these may be incredibly common. And some of these chains exhibit subclonality. Though these, these are each important points in and of themselves, but I'm going to tell you why we think they're even more important when you put them all together. Now, one of the reasons why they're important is because known cantogenes are off, they often are disrupted genetically in the context of chromoplexy. So this is a nice pictorial representation of a well-known tumor suppressor, the P10 locus, where you can see there's all kinds of disruption uh, occurring in a region. Uh, these, these, this happens to be a chromoplexy event, uh, and P10 is involved. But actually, if you go and tabulate cancer genes, you find that there are a whole series of them uh, that are recurrently involved in chromoplexy, including, very importantly, these uh, ETS fusion uh, re rearrangements. So, you know, ETS either ERG or ETV1, these ETS factors are the subject of rearrangement in at least 40 to 50 percent of prostate cancers, but the majority of them occurred in the context of chromoplexy, which means that chromoplexy, uh, the, the initiating event for chromoplexy happens upstream of the ETS rearrangements. And there are a whole bunch of other cancer genes that had this uh, phenomenon. The other thing was that we looked across other lineage for which we had whole genome data, and we found evidence of chromoplexy in several additional cancer types, uh, head and neck cancer, breast, lung cancers, and melanoma. So we think, although it's incredibly prevalent in prostate cancer, it may well be, uh, have some prevalence and importance in other lineage as well. So this is why we are maybe uh, precociously, but we are labeling this fundamental insight number five, because we think it's telling us something about tumor evolution that we maybe hadn't fully appreciated. So here on the left is kind of your, your classical way of depicting tumor evolution, which is that every cell division, you get errors in the DNA and they accumulate, and over time, you get more and more mutations, and at some point, you cross a threshold where you get just the wrong collection of mutations, and you're a cancer. So this is the classical Darwinist view of evolution. Now, a few years ago, Phil Stevens and the Sanger Institute taught us that there can be an opposite extreme, where you get a catastrophic event that has massive pulverizations of focal regions of chromosomes. This was called chromothripsis. Uh, and so catastrophe can sort of be the opposite end of this spectrum, whereas gradualism is on one end, catastrophe is on the other. What we think that chromoplexy is doing is sort of, it's in the middle, uh, because these are not as uh, catastrophic, but they are clearly uh, more um, uh, impactful than single nucleotide substitution. So we think that this is sort of akin to punctuated equilibrium uh, from uh, a la Stephen Jay Gould. So this is punctuated evolution, and there's evidence for this because uh, there's clearly punctuation within uh, prostate cancers because you can see multiple chain events, you can see exa examples of subclonality, and importantly, as I mentioned, uh, cancer genes tend to be dysregulated by these events. So we think that this is an important uh, modality of evolution that had not been sort of appreciated before. Uh, and the other, re I'll just sort of throw out a speculation that if we could understand why these events happen, so what is the error that, go that, that happens when these transcriptional hubs, or it may not always be transcriptional, maybe it's chromatin, what is that? Could we reduce that? A little bit. If we had a way to reduce that error rate, even just lowering the slope a little bit, perhaps that would be a chemo prevention mechanism. Maybe fewer prostate cancers would occur. I, I realize it's total speculation, but it's certainly something we can speculate about because we have whole cancer genome data for the first time. Okay, another area that caught us, at least our group, uh, largely by surprise, was an insight that recently we had into the dark matter of the cancer genome. So uh, we genomicists call dark matter regions of the genome that we cannot easily interpret. These are, uh, as you heard from Ewan, for example, regulatory regions, intergenic regions, uh, some of the repeat-rich DNA. Uh, and, was, and in cancer, we often think about uh, the aneuploidy that's not focal. We don't really understand uh, always what it's actually doing. Is, that, is it uh, multifactorial or is it just noise or what have you? So, we asked a question, we had, we were in, in a study of melanoma, we had a certain critical mass of melanoma genomes, and we asked the question, are there any uh, nucleotide substitutions, somatic mutations, 
that occur at the same nucleotide more than once, which is actually, if you think about it, a statistically unlikely event unless there's, uh, uh, particularly in a non-genic or regulatory region. And what we saw when we looked at the, the initial set of uh, melanomas that we had enough coverage to assess was that 17 of 19 had one of two mutations within uh, just upstream of the transcriptional start site of the telomerase promoter. Now, the, this was melanoma, and so it was, it was actually tantalizing because these were both CDT transitions which occur in the context of UV damage, and they were mutually exclusive. Now, uh, this is one of these things where, like Ewan described in his talk, we saw this, actually we, we, we published sort of an initial paper on these genomes, and we had seen this event, but we didn't mention it because I was skeptical. I said, this can't possibly rewrite. There's no way there is a somatic mutation that's happening at the same nucleotide at this frequency. There's got to be a bug. So we're not reporting this because if it's wrong, I'm going to look stupid. And I don't want to look stupid. So we sat on it. And, and actually, it turned out to be a, a bit of a pain to validate because the region was kind of GC rich and you know, sequinome didn't work. And so finally, we re resorted to old-fashioned Sanger sequencing. And that worked. And it turned out that in a uh, actually relatively small validation set, the numbers held up. Uh, one or the other of these mutations uh, was present in 70% uh, of melanomas. And what was even more tantalizing was that when you looked at the DNA context around these mutations, uh, they both, uh, as a result of the mutation, you ended up with a, an 11 nucleotide stretch, but in the center was a consensus etch factor binding site, an etch transcription factor binding site. So this obviously suggested that these are biologically consequential, and in particular, they might bring an etch factor and turn on uh, transcription from the TERP promoter. So the first experiment to do to test this idea uh, worked nicely. So these were cloned, these mutations were cloned upstream uh, in, within the context of the TERP promoter upstream of luciferase. And you could see in a whole series of cell lines that each mutation was able, with a range of you know, two to four fold or thereabouts, to increase expression from the TERP promoter. So the mutations appear to be functionally consequential. We don't know for sure that it's an ETS factor that's binding, but certainly the, it, they made sense. And then we, through another project uh, that was uh, funded by Novartis, we had whole genome sequencing data from about 150 cell lines. And so we looked for one or the other variant across that collection. And indeed, they started popping up, three out of three bladder cancer lines, a thyroid cancer line, uh, again in melanoma, uh, liver, four out of five uh, hepatocellular lines. Uh, also, you can see there were three out of four CNS lines. And we, and this is another example of the, the PI in the lab being too conservative. We didn't want to, uh, uh, we didn't want to make such a big deal about this because the numbers were small. But now, uh, a, a group from uh, North Carolina in collaboration with Ver Bert Vogelstein has, has looked at this locus across about 1,200 tumors. And indeed, these exact tumor types pop up as highly recurrently having one or the other of these mutations. So it really means that this non-coding uh, mutation, one of the, these mutations together are among the most commonly uh, somatically mutated nucleotides now in the genome. So it's a remarkable thing. Tells us that the dark matter may be hiding some surprises, uh, many other surprises that we didn't know about. So in the last uh, few minutes of the talk, I want to move from uh, what I would argue are, have been very gratifying biological insights into the potential importance of the cancer genome in precision medicine. And there are three underlying principles that I just want to drive home about the genetics and precision medicine. The first one is that molecular pathways involved in tumor survival and progression are often activated by genetic alterations. Now, one of the uh, disappointments, if you will, of sequencing cancer genomes was that when this all started, you know, there was the discovery of BRAF in 50% of melanomas and the discovery of PR3 kinase mutations in colon cancer and EGFR and lung cancer, and it, all these kinases were being mutated, and kinases are druggable. So the, the promise was, oh, we just have to sequence more cancers, and all these kinases that are druggable are going to pop out, and pretty soon cancer is going to be a chronic disease uh, if you can treat with them kinase inhibitors. But in fact, it turned out that there aren't a whole lot of kinase mutations uh, that we found when we started uh, going more deeply. But nonetheless, if you step back and you start to uh, catalog several of the major common solid tumors, you know, lung cancers, breast cancer, colorectal cancer, melanoma, head and neck, et cetera, and then you do bar graph form for glioblastoma and ovarian, uh, and this is using TCGA data and some other data. And if you just annotate those, those collections of cancers, for the presence of mutations that are plausibly actionable. Now, by actionable, we don't necessarily mean there's an FDA-approved drug out there, but we might well mean that there's a clinical trial or there's something that we should not do. There's a drug we should not use 
now that we know the mutation there. If you aggregate and you do kind of a back of the envelope calculation, you realize that in several major tumor types, 40 to 60 percent harbor at least one genetic alteration that affects an actionable proliferation or survival mechanism. That is a very reasonable number. So even though, yes, we didn't, it turns out that, that, that you know, there are, every major cancer type doesn't have 50 percent of one or another kinase mutated, there is a lot that we could do clinically with the information that we already understand. And that says nothing about the chromatin alterations and metabolism that we don't yet have a way to target. So the second principle is that we are now living in a special time in history, which is that for the first time, there are many, many anti-cancer agents that target all of the classical oncogenic pathways in clinical trials. So here's a graph that sort of shows this schematically. These are uh, some of the well-known uh, pathway effectors, the MAP kinase pathway, the PR3 kinase pathway, and some of the others. Here's some chromatin factors. These are receptor, receptor tyrosine kinases. And if the box or a square has a solid line around it, that means there's at least one drug, and usually there's more than one drug, targeting that in the clinic. So this is the first time where not only do we have a knowledge of a large swath of potentially actionable events, but we have tools, we have experimental compounds, or sometimes FDA-approved compounds, that could hit those altered pathways. And finally, uh, as, as you know, oh, I left a slide out. Well, the, the, the third point was that we have the technology, but of course, you already know that. We have master of the parallel sequencing, and it can be used in the clinic. So, uh, so, so basically, actually, let me skip ahead here because I realized that I had made a, this is the problem of making last minute changes. You forgot what you actually put in. So here's the third uh, point, which is that uh, we now have the ability uh, in the clinical arena to do robust uh, and reasonably comprehensive genomic profiling. And here's another area where uh, NHGRI, I think, was really forward-looking because in early 2011, they put out a request for applications about clinical sequencing exploratory research. It's come to be known as CSER, and we put a grant out, and we were very fortunate with the, with the help also of the NCI to be uh, awarded one of the first grants in cancer. And so we now have a project ongoing at Dana-Farber together with the Broad Institute that we call CanSeq, obviously for cancer sequencing. Uh, the project that's NHGRI funded is focusing on lung and colon cancer, but we've been able to expand uh, to other cancers. Uh, as well, uh, and it's, it's a very gratifying, uh, the, the, the enrollment, we are barely able to keep up with the patients that are being enrolled uh, to get this, uh, and what this study, by the way, is whole exome sequencing. So we are doing whole exome sequencing and we're figuring out a way to interpret the entire exome, if possible, and make that palatable to busy clinicians, and there's a whole lot that, behind that. Now, one of the things that you've heard from previous speakers is the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the cost of sequencing is falling, but the, uh, the data points that are coming because the costs are falling are uh, skyrocketing. So if you look at clinical data points per patient that a doc has to go through, so up until about you know, six, seven years ago, there are, you know, in the dozens of laboratory values that a clinician, together with a physical exam and other his points of the history, you know, there are a few dozen uh, data points that they have to collect to kind of come up with a differential diagnosis and decide how to treat. Well, you know, once we sort of started using kind of the early pass of cancer genetic information, which was maybe a few, uh, a few dozen genes and a few hundred mutations by genotyping technology, already we could see a bump to around maybe 100 data points that you had to consider. But now, as we're doing whole exome sequencing and you consider transcriptome and other things, we're now skyrocketing. So the, the data points per patient, of course, are an inverse to uh, Moore's law, and this is a challenge. Now, Ali Van Allen, who's a medical oncologist in our group, uh, but also has a background in computer science from Stanford, turns out to be the perfect blend uh, to attack this problem. So he's come up with an algorithm uh, that he calls file for short for uh, precision heuristics for interpreting the alteration landscape, which takes the output of exomes and then uh, splays them out on, he calls them sort of a virtual gel, where at the top are the mo cl most clinically actionable variants, and then you kind of go down and say, well, these aren't technically actionable, but we should look at the biological relevance because they might be hitting a pathway in some way that could be actionable, and then you kind of go down the list. But I'm not sure why this is happening. Um, but the, uh, so, so file is kind of our first pass at the exome level of trying to get uh, this kind of information. Now, the, so, so file itself, you guys, those of you like me are Lord of the Rings nerds will recognize that this, is, this comes from the Lord of the Rings. The file of Galadriel was given to Frodo at a really uh, mission critical time where everything looked lost. And the quote was, may it be a light to you in dark places when all other lights go out. And we actually thought this was a great 
name because this, these are for metastatic cancer patients. They are getting their exome sequence when they have run out of standard of care options. So the question is, can we shed a little bit of light, give maybe a glimmer of uh, additional set of options when there's much, uh, not much else uh, going for them at that point? And then Ellie has also uh, cobbled this together in a, a web-based tool that uh, reads out uh, the alterations. We, al we also have a, um, we have a, a group, a tumor board of, of genetics, germline and somatic experts who go through this, uh, and we have an, an ability provisionally to make a report that can go to, clini to clinicians. So briefly, uh, this is all great. We use genetics to identify dependency, give rational therapeutics, we get responses. But resistance is a major problem. To overcome those, we're going to have to make combinations uh, that give us long-term control. So the other area that we're actively working on is to sequence uh, tumors that have not only prior to treatment, but after a great response po following relapse. This is a patient who had metastatic melanoma. And this patient happened to have a MEK1 mutation, which as you can see in these uh, kill curves here, will shift the GI50, me meaning they confer resistance to RAF inhibitors uh, and MEK inhibitors. There are other MEK mutations that have been discovered like this. Fortunately, though, ERK inhibitors, which hit one more module downstream, appear to overcome this. So this is the kind of data that we hope to achieve uh, that will teach us about resistance. Now, I'm just going to briefly mention uh, this was an RNAi screening study which looked for loss of function mechanisms, genes that when silenced confer resistance. And what came out of this study, this was in melanoma as well, was that NF1 uh, was the top resistance gene uh, it clearly working to cause resistance. The reason why I wanted to bring this up is twofold. One, it's, a, it, it's important to think about loss of function mechanisms for resistance as well as gain of function. The other reason is that uh, the last time I was in this auditorium, I talked about NF1 and neglected to mention that Francis Collins uh, had discovered it, and uh, somebody gently pointed that out to me. So I vowed that if I ever came back to this auditorium, I would not make that mistake twice. So NF1 <laughs> is a resistance gene in melanoma, and when we sequence the exome, so here's another little, little subtlety. We found several patients that have NF1 mutations. Uh, one of them is a standard stop codon, uh, which obviously disrupts the protein, but the other three, and one of them is clearly somatic, are occurring in splice uh, enhancer regions, uh, or uh, so, so either splice motifs or splice enhancer regions. So again, outside of the coding region can be an important place to look. So let me just, uh, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because I just want to close uh, by pointing out that what genomics is now doing for us in cancer is putting forth a new vision for how we need to think, not just about yet about routine practice, but how are we going to do clinical trials. So what the, th the thinking is that patients who come in the door, uh, maybe they have a fresh biopsy, maybe you use archival tissue, but you're going to generate some kind of an omic profile. And I think the point about starting with genetics is important, but it's not all that's going to be needed. There needs to be a way to interpret the data, make a decision, monitor response. There may need to be, even in the clinical trial realm, a second biopsy to understand is the, is the patient responding? Is the pathway being hit using genetics uh, and transcriptomics to help with that? And then finally, at the point of resistance, uh, maybe doing another biopsy to inform you the salvage therapy or, in the future, combinations that could be given to, to patients going, going forward. So this is my last slide. Sometimes in, the, in these kinds of meetings, we tend to take a historical look because of how much has been accomplished. And sometimes that makes it feel like, well, maybe this is all done. We, this is all great. We've done all these great things. But we are only just getting started. Uh, the atlas. I think maybe it looks, this is sort of a, whatever, 17th or 18th century atlas, or maybe 16th century, where we didn't really understand what North America looked like. We knew that there was a new world, but we didn't really have any detail. We need to uh, get more detail by completing the mutational axis, expanding the axis in, across disease, metastasis, obviously r following relapse of therapy. We need to annotate the, the genome and understand mechanistically how all these alterations contribute to cancer. And then, of course, systematic clinical implementation in a way that can test the utility. Uh, and, of course, the ability to share this data worldwide is going to be an important issue. So I'll, I'll close there. There are many people who has, have contributed to the work that I showed. Uh, the, the most important ones are listed here. And if there's time, I'll take questions. So one of the consequences of our speakers having so much to say is that we are running behind. So I think we won't take questions now. <clears throat> and you can talk to Levi uh, separately. And now I'd like to introduce Dan Roden from Vanderbilt, who is going to be talking about engineering a healthcare system to deliver genomic medicine. 